science connects the complexity of life. It guides public policy. It uncovers new opportunities. Science connects researchers on Virginia Tech's campus, builds powerful industry partnerships, and helps solve the challenges that face our lives today. Hi everyone, this is Becky Freemall with Science Connects here on Virginia Tech's campus, and with me is John Jalesco. John is with the School of Plant and Environmental Science, and specifically you study poison ivy. John, welcome. Thank you. Um, I know about poison ivy all too well, <laughs> and I'm not even a researcher. <laughs> um, first, talk about a little bit about your background and what got you to where you are today with your research. So um, I'm a plant scientist. Uh, my background is in microbiology, and for the past several decades, I've been a plant molecular biologist, studying okay. plant molecular biology. And I'm particularly interested in all of these really bizarre chemicals that plants make. Mm -hmm. um, I'm interested in how they make them and what is their ecological context. Why poison ivy? Why poison ivy? <laughs> well... The truth of the matter is my poison ivy research began in 2012 after this large windstorm that blew through uh, southwest Virginia. It was a derecho, so-called derecho. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hurricane force winds, no humidity. And this storm blew down this white oak in my backyard. And a couple days later, my wife and I are out prepping up, getting chainsaw and whatnot, and I'm there wearing long pants and boots and a short sleeve shirt. And my wife, who's very sensible, um, brought to my attention that I might want to put on a long sleeve shirt because there is poison ivy out around and possibly on this tree. And my response to this, I attribute to a, mm, kind of a classic case of chainsaw-induced testosterone poisoning. <laughs> so my response to that very sensible <laughs> suggestion was literally, no, dear, I know what poison ivy looks like. I'm a molecular biologist. Oh, uh, see, you, you deserved it almost. <laughs> well... <laughs> Needless to say, oh man! The next day, I started getting you know rash on the arm and mm -hmm. whatnot. And as it turns out, <laughs> I, I really didn't cut through any poison ivy with yeah. that chainsaw. In fact, the chainsaw was an electric chainsaw, and it had the electric cord. Uh -huh. And what I had done was I had inadvertently dragged that cord through these two very tiny little poison <sighs> ivy seedlings that were just starting to grow in our yard. And then naturally, when the job was done, I started it. wrapped the cord around my <sighs> forearm and elbow and hand. Yes. And, well, you know, the next day, um, I was eating a lot of crow. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> yeah. So, but I, I had never really had poison ivy. I grew up out west where there was poison oak, and uh. I never really had very bad case. So, you know, I'm a scientist and mm -hmm. I was like, well, you know, let's just see where this goes. You know, honestly, how bad can it get? I love that you went out to like find the source. If I had poison ivy, I would be like, oh, it's out in the backyard. It's got to be careful next time. You like went out, found the two plants exactly, that they're only seedlings. <laughs> yeah. Well, it turned out that um, basically it wasn't very pleasant. No, it's not. It's and, not at all. <laughs> you know, I had never had anything that itched in quite that manner and quite that consistently 24-7. Mm-hmm. And where I really found uh, the most discomfort was at nighttime. At nighttime, I would try and lay down and go to sleep, and there were only one of two thoughts that came to my mind. Should I go to sleep, or should I claw my flesh off? Should I go to sleep, or should I scratch? And It's a hard decision. It, it, well, you know, the first one just wasn't in the cards at all because all the itching. Yeah. Um, just scratching endlessly, obviously, is not a good way to go. So... After about a week of this, and it was quite a bit of insomnia, it suddenly dawned on me, wait a minute, I study plant chemicals. I study how plants make chemicals. <laughs> what do we know about this plant? So I spent a lot of insomnia-induced searching through the scientific literature about poison ivy, and there was an huh. astonishingly small amount of information, scientific information, that was just focused on poison ivy. 
Interesting. It was very interesting. Well, thanks to you now, we have more, I hope. <laughs> it, it began a path along those lines. Um, I was very struck by that. Um, I was just surprised that there were so few people who have actually spent the time to study the plant. So as an academic, that was just Amazing. like candy. Yeah, <laughs> it was irresistible. <laughs> Had to go after that. Um, and some of the things that I learned were really quite astonishing. Um, most of the information was about the medical attributes of the allergenic rash mm -hmm. that comes from this chemical that the plant makes called Eurytia. There was very, very little about the plant itself, where it likes to grow, how it makes this chemical, where it makes this chemical, why it makes this chemical. All of those were largely not discussed in the scientific literature. So that started my path down that road. Well, and I've gotten poison ivy my entire life, and I have never heard the term urethial. I mean, I just knew it had some oil that got me, and that was bad. Yeah, well, that's don't good enough. It. Yeah. <laughs> For most people, that that's, you know, you can do a lot with that information. And listen to your spouse. I'll pay attention to that one, too. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, well, Absolutely. talk about where you studied it. I understand you've done research along the Appalachian Trail. Why, why the Appalachian Trail? I think most people encounter this plant similar to myself in sort of, you know, their backyards or recreational areas. You go camping, you know, edge of the campground, things right. like that. And one of the things that was not clear in the literature at all is, you know, where is the natural habitat for poison ivy? I mean, it's obviously a native plant it's in North America, but where does it really like to live? Mm -hmm. So what we decided to do is we needed some way to kind of go out into natural environments, but sample lots of different environments. We certainly wanted to know where it was, but equally important was where it wasn't, because presumably where it's not growing is unfavorable habitat, and that isn't known either. Right. So um, nearby to Virginia Tech, not more than 20-minute drive, um, is a section of the Appalachian Trail. And that seemed like a really nice natural landscape where we could go through uh, different habitats, different forest habitats, where the forest, you know, basically opens up to fields, right. goes in and out of man-made habitats and back into natural habitats. Just lots of environmental uh, variation. And it was nearby. Yes, it's <laughs> close, so go with it. Yeah, so the other aspect of the Appalachian Trail that marks it are these white blazes. Uh -huh. So these basically white paint on trees that tells you you're on the Appalachian Trail. And what we decided to do is every time we would come to one of those white marks, one of those white blazes, we would just stop, look around, and evaluate is poison ivy here or not, get a GPS coordinate for that particular location, and then go on to the next one. And um, over the course of that, we collected over approximately 2,000 data points wow. that we then could use uh, GPS coordinates to extract out all of this uh, GPS indexed environmental data that we now could basically evaluate, not just each white spot, but what is the amount of rainfall at that spot? What is the cover of that spot, the land cover? Right. Um, what's the altitude? What's the average temperature? Just lots and lots of data that we can use to put into models to figure out where this plant likes to live. And what did you find out, too, in regards to the variation in plant growth and its habits and, and leaves? Are they all different, or is it the same kind of poison? People always say, and I don't know if this is true, oh, well, poison ivy in Wisconsin is different than Virginia than it is in Ohio. It looks different. Are there different plant variations, or is poison ivy poison ivy? Poison ivy is like a great shapeshifter. Oh, okay. So it is different. I have seen leaves that look incredibly different on the same plant. Really? Yeah. Oh, great. Um, so, <laughs> so you never know. <laughs> yeah. It makes it kind of, it does make it difficult to identify the plant right. for a lot of people. Camouflaged. Right. And huh. we don't really understand why it's like that. Um, it's kind of an interesting question. Um, so do you, are, have, I don't even know how to ask the question. How many variations are there? I mean, are there tons or is it one variation that just grows a million different kind of leaves or you don't know yet? You know, we really don't know yet. Okay. Um, there's been reported as many as nine different subspecies in oh. North America. Okay. Um, but, uh, there's a lot more. Now that we can look at the genetic composition of these plants, I think we can begin to ask some of those questions of whether right. these 
different shapes are really the same species or different ones. Um, it can grow, it, not only do the leaves look different, but its overall growth habit can grow very differently. Oh, okay. um, a lot of people see it climbing up trees in their backyard, so vines that climb up trees. Um, those vines can also climb along the ground and um, basically make these short mm -hmm. individual shoots. Um, and in other cases, it can grow as a shrub, you know, like as tall as people, kind of a woody shrub. So outside of um, the Appalachian Trail and the oak tree with the two little seedlings in your backyard, mm. um, if you're, I mean, just because you're allergic to poison ivy doesn't mean you shouldn't go out and enjoy nature. But when I hear you talking about the Appalachian Trail, for example, I like to run that. And, and that makes me a little nervous that there's that much poison ivy. Um, where all can you find it? How can you enjoy the great outdoors, but maybe try to avoid some of the places that you'll right. find it? I mean, I, I think the answer is it's everywhere. And one of the remarkable findings from this Appalachian Trail study is that if you really want to avoid this plant, go out on the AT and go out in the middle of the woods because there's not very much out there. Oh, good. Where we began to find poison ivy consistently was when the trail would start entering into areas that humans had disrupted. So like really? an agricultural field or when you're crossing a road or if you're going by, you know, someone's uh, home, <laughs> really? all of a sudden the amount of poison ivy would increase. Whereas out in the middle of the forest, there was remarkably little of it. People are not planting this like rose gardens. Why is that happening? <laughs> Those are really interesting <laughs> questions to us right now. Poison ivy really seems to like human-disturbed habitats. Huh. It likes them a lot. It knows where its victims are. <laughs> <laughs> it certainly seems to like some environmental conditions. Uh, it, it's known that it kind of likes the edge of forests. Okay. And um, some of that is because we know that birds uh, eat the seeds and then it goes through the gut of the oh. bird and then it gets distributed. So, you know, if you have a nice hedge in your yard or fence row that, or, you know, power lines that are inviting to birds, well, sure, you're going to start seeing poison ivy turn up. Birds. Darn birds. those birds. <laughs> oh, they're wonderful. Mm -hmm. You're not making me love them right now, but I'm sure they're <laughs> wonderful in other scenarios. Um, let's talk about animals. Are they also allergic to poison ivy, the ones that are out in the forest where they apparently can't find us? <laughs> yeah, the main animals that we know are allergic to uh, poison ivy turns out to be people like you, Becky. <laughs> Every time you go into the woods, you I are an it. animal out there. True. That is. Um, <laughs> we are really quite astonished. Um, we have not been able to identify any native animal species that gets the same type of skin rashes that humans do. And huh. we don't really understand this because humans were not around here in North America where poison ivy evolved from. Okay. Um, we're still looking. <laughs> we do know that animals are eating a lot of poison ivy. So we've done some studies where we've uh, put out poison ivy seeds, thousands of them, waited for them to germinate. And what we found was over 90% of the seeds that germinated were very quickly eaten. But you don't know by who? Or... Well, for a long what? time, we weren't sure. We finally got some video documentation that uh, deer, most likely, huh. are uh, big predators. Um, we have some other experiments where we tried to cage out deer and let other size animals come in and out. And it seems like animals of lots of different sizes, ranging from deer to, um, I don't know, skunks or groundhog size right. or rabbit, um, are eating it. And even insects are eating it. So I'm so not a botanist, but if I recall, I think it was marigolds or what you're supposed to plant to keep deer away or some, some kind of flower, but they'll eat poison ivy instead. Very much so. <laughs> and it might not be marigolds. I could be wrong. I, I, unlike you, cannot keep a plant alive to save my life. <laughs> so when they say to start with a plant and work your way up, I would have never had kids if I did that. <laughs> 
<laughs> just stay away from them. Um, okay, so let's talk about this evil chemical that I just do not like at all, your Sure. Um, is there anything it is good for other, well, then other than nothing that I can think of that it's good for? <laughs> yes, actually. Um, it is good for art. Really? Art? Really? Art. So it turns out in Asia, in East Asia, there's a tree called the lacquer tree. It's closely related to the poison sumac tree here in North America. Okay. And that tree uh, produces the same exact chemical that is produced in poison sumac, which is the same one that's produced in poison ivy. They're very close cousins. And East Asia, that sap has been harvested for over 9,000 years. In, they'll scratch the bark of the tree, mm -hmm. and then that bark will start weeping this oil. Ugh. And people have will collect that oil into little pots using sticks and whatnot. And then they'll take that oil, which is called urishi in Japanese word for it, which just means the sap from the urishi tree. But then they take that sap and paint it onto wooden objects like uh, bowls, wooden bowls and wooden chopsticks. And that sap, that oil, that urishi oil actually, mm -hmm. will cure into this hard, waterproof, high luster, incredibly beautiful varnish or lacquer. Interesting. And um, there's actually been some archaeological artifacts that have been dated back to 9,000 years where people were actually using this. They lasted that long, like they held there. Yes. Wow. So all I want to do is itch as we're talking about this, by right. the way. Well, I keep... <laughs> once, fair enough. <laughs> once that lacquer uh, uh, cures, if you will, yeah. it, all the chemistry that causes the itching on humans changes okay and now it's not allergenic it just is this very beautiful high luster highly valued actually um artisan craftware and someone like you and i who are allergic to the chemical can pick this absolutely up. up i have a vase in my uh office that is uh lacquerware made of urishi oil was that on purpose um, at the time when I bought it, no. Okay. <laughs> but it turned out to be a very fortuitous uh, collection that they had. I was just wondering if it was a gift from your wife, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so talk about uh, poison ivy in general and why the biology of poison ivy is important to humans. Well, I think, you know, the reason why it's, it's fairly obvious, people suffer right. from this plant mightily. I like that answer. Um about 80% of the human population uh, is sensitive to skin contact and the allergenic rash that forms from that. And then the other 20% either have not been sensitized to it yet or seem to never be able to be sensitized to it. And there's probably some genetic disposition that is responsible for that. And that 20% just lead charmed lives as yes, far they as do. I'm concerned. Yes, they definitely do. It is My husband, I think, is one of the charmed life mm. uh, individuals, mm. and I would love to be that. But I bet he does most of the gardening as yeah. well. <laughs> we have, so far, knock on wood, now that I've said anything, do that, um, we have not come across any in our backyard. And I was telling you that we have a, a wooded area in mm. our backyard, and that's funny to me because that's where I always think it might be. Mm -hmm. But now that I'm talking to you, it sounds like that might be the least likely place to, to find it. And in the nice hedges and... That's the area I need to be more concerned about. And that's where I do most of the yard work. Ah, I do have okay. him do more of the work in the woods for that reason. Ah, that might change. I have to flop that <laughs> around. Exactly. Uh, well, so not only important to humans, but talk about the biology of poison ivy and why it's interesting specifically to a scientist. Part of my interest is how this chemical is produced in the plant. So I'm interested in the genes and the enzymes that are responsible for making this chemical. Um, to date, we know very little about that. None of the genes or even enzymes or even the steps in the biosynthesis of this thing has been characterized. There's some predictions and we're, we're starting some lines of experimentation to you know, follow those predictions and see where they go. But um, it's also kind of an unusual type of chemical mm -hmm. uh, compared to other types of compounds that are made by plants that are defensive in nature, this one's pretty different. So that novelty is also uh, very interesting. 
You know, and just my final question to kind of wrap this all up. Um, where do you see this research in 10 years? And we kind of talked about this earlier and, and we kind of discussed looking at 10 years also kind of involves looking back at the history as well. Talk a little bit about that. Sure. So humans have dramatically changed the landscapes that we live in. Um, many people have referred to this as the Anthropocene, where humans are just changing the environment on a whole global scale. And, you know, hence the term Anthropocene. Um, so part of my interests are understanding what was this, how did this plant fit into the ecology before humans came? Um, and we really don't have a clear idea of that right now. I mean, clearly birds are part of that. <laughs> yes. But, um, you know, this chemical very much looks and acts like a defensive chemical. We just don't really know what animal it's trying to defend itself against. And that's kind of an enduring, seemingly obvious question, but one in which the answers are by no means straightforward at this time. Um, another aspect of this chemical, so I told you that it made this really great, you know, lacquer right. coating. And, yeah. You know, that discovery was made, you know, at least 9,000 years ago. Um, we're also interested in producing this chemical as a biosustainable chemical feedstock for various types of coatings. So right now, if you look around in a room, you know, there's very few things that are not coated with some sort of paint or varnish or whatnot. Mm -hmm. And the vast majority of those chemicals are all basically petrochemical derived mm -hmm. from underground. And, you know, at some point, we're not entirely sure when, but that's a finite resource that is going to go away. Right. Yeah. And what we're interested in is developing biosustainable chemical feedstocks for our material environment, for coatings, for um, high-performance materials. There's some interesting aspects of this chemical and the way it cures, if you will, that uh, have some very interesting high-performance applications. Mm -hmm. So what we'd like to do... Is, our ambition, yeah. is to identify the genes in the plants, take them out of the plants and put them into some microbe where now we can feed that microbe some chem, you know, organic chemical waste stream mm -hmm. that we can now recycle the chemicals, let's say, from municipal sewage, if you will. Right. And instead of you know, having that be a waste product, recycle that carbon into these high performance, very useful materials to help support a, um, a sustainable material economy that doesn't require on finite resources like oil that is sucked out of the ground, but rather um, essentially start looking toward sustainable economies. Wow. It's kind of like making lemonade out of lemons, yes. making good out of this Ureshial stuff currently just causes rashes. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Putting um, that to, you know, some very novel um, right. uses. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, John, thank you so much for coming out and talking. Poison Ivy guys, I'm going to call you. I mean, you have a much better title, I'm sure, but Poison Ivy guy is what I'm going with. You're welcome. It's my pleasure to be of service. Very good. Well, with John Jalesco, I'm Becky Freemall here on Virginia Tech's campus, and thanks for joining us for another edition of Science Connects. Sharing knowledge accelerates discovery. To learn about other transdisciplinary collaborations, go to research.vt.edu.